Welcome to Key Factors Podcast, where knowledge meets ambition in the fast-paced world of real estate and mortgage. I'm your host, Mark Jones, bringing you the latest insight, trends, and expert advice to navigate this dynamic property market. In each episode, we dive deep into the heart of the industry, dissecting market movement, exploring investment strategies, and unlocking the secret to real estate success. Whether you're a seasoned professional, an aspiring investor, or simply looking to stay ahead of the curve, this is the ultimate guide to making informed decisions in the world of property and real estate. So grab a seat and let's uncover the key factors that make all the difference. Welcome to Key Factors Podcast. Welcome back, everybody. It's Mark Jones, your host of Key Factors Podcast, and we are sponsored by ReviewMyMortgage.com, the largest index of mortgage programs in the nation. And uh, just recently had an awesome episode discussion with uh, one of my great friends from back in the day, uh, still crushing the game, and we ran out of time. So today we're going to be bringing you part two with Austin Pantuso, the life of a real estate broker. Austin, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. I Absolutely, so man. Living the dream today. So. so you're drinking out of your Superman mug today. Because one of those days, huh? Today I have to be Superman. Today, there you go. For sure. Just it's, like it's, every it day. It is one of those days. You do have to be Superman every day. Absolutely. You got to wake up and, and be that. So yeah. That's exactly right. So what do you want to talk about? What do you well, want to start off with? Well, so- Last episode, last discussion, part one, we talked about how awesome it is that you were selected to be a part of uh, American Dream mm -hmm. Show, so people can be on the lookout for that in March. Is in, in March. Very yeah. good. Probably, probably early March. Very so. good. We talked about um, you becoming a broker from being a realtor, your, um, your path, your journey. Uh, we talked about the NAR ruling and, and got your thoughts on that. That was a great conversation. Um, we talked about new construction. The incentives that they're going may not always be the best for your customer, but right now, it's pretty good, pretty, pretty good darn deal. Um, and then we've got a slew of things that we didn't get to. So, so today, I want to open it up on the first topic, which is going to be home affordability. Um, can we, can we go back to new construction versus yeah, sure. real quick? Yeah, we, this is, this is your time, brother. Uh, well, well, I want to clarify some things that I said, because okay. I was incorrect on, on some things. Okay. When I was saying January, I meant December stats. Okay. But remember we, I was, I was referencing Sabor market stats, which yeah. is, is huge for anyone. It's public info. So you can Well go, then let's, yeah, let's show it. these folks what so, it is. Uh, JC, so can if you, you can throw that reference yeah, up. I want you to pull this up and, and I want to show you and kind of show you what here. happened in, from December to January. Cause okay. it's crazy. What Tell happened. me where to go on here. So go to, um, go to San Antonio area market report. Okay. Look at that. There you go. And then go down. I want to go down. And this is, anyone can look at this. If you're a realtor, you should market be looking at reports. this all the time. If you're, if this is your geographical area that you mainly you know, uh, do your business in. Sure. Why not look at this? Oh, I see agree. What's going on. So check this out. Go to December. Okay. Let's pop open December. It's going to be a PDF. Yeah. So, so let's you got to do January gonna, also. Yeah. So open, open that December PDF and let's, let's look at this and then let's look at January and kind of compare this. So here is December. I'm going to throw this up. up on the screen here. Come okay. On. Um, almost. Let's see take, here. Take your time. Take your time. There we, there go. we go. Okay. So can we zoom in a little bit? We and... sure can. I've got all the keys to the kingdom there today. Go. Okay. So what, you know, you can always look at current month, right? And you can see month, but I don't like looking at that. I like looking right? at year over, over year. And if you go down, okay. you'll see that. So go down a little bit farther and it, see that's still current month. Go down, yep. go down, go down. And then look at year to date. There you go. There you go. As of, as of December, 2023. Yep. So a couple of things we want to pay attention to, and I don't have the mouse, but you're going to have to do it. So not all new and existing because that bunches it together, right? Right. And we were talking about new versus pre-owned. Correct. And the stats, right? So check this out. Existing single family, look at your dollar volume and your, your closed listings year over year, negative 23%. Yep. From December, that's insane, right? Wow. That's, that's a huge decrease. Absolutely. Right? Now is. go check out single family new construction. Look at new the construction. increase. So now we're cruising down. For those of you that are listening, uh, if you want to head over to YouTube and see what we're watching or what we're referencing, uh, we are pulling up the report for December of 2023 um, from Sabor's website. Again, like Austin mentioned, this is public information that uh, every realtor, being that your income is derived from selling properties, should be paying attention to this stuff. 
So look at new construction, 39% wow. increase. Oh, I yeah. mean, that is insane. We're talking about what a, a 62% disparity between Absolutely. the two, right? Yeah. Year over year. That is crazy. I mean, one shrank tremendously and the other grew tremendously. Tremendously. And, and it goes hand in hand and you could throw it off, uh, JC. Um, it goes hand in hand with the concept of home affordability simply because if there isn't enough pre-owned inventory, you are at the mercy of the builder and where they build, price points that they build, et cetera. Matter of fact, there was a uh, podcast that I was listening to not too long ago where they basically broke down the concept of we are going to have another huge, massive property shortage again in the next five years, simply because obviously we keep procreating, generations continue. Mm -hmm. And we're already seeing a shortage. And what happens is builders don't start building homes until they have the people lined up to pretty much sell them, which it's smart on their part. So they're not carrying uh, inventory that that's just sure. sitting. But at the same time, they're behind the curve by hundreds of thousands of homes. I mean, sometimes depending, right? I mean, yes, sometimes they are. And I think it depends on the product, the price sure. point right? mm -hmm. and, and their target market. Right? Yeah. Some they do sit there for a while. Correct. You know, but it depends that what is our most affordable range in, in our, our area. Do in you know? our area, I believe, yeah. matter of fact, it's, uh, it's, JC, if you want to throw our, this up on the screen, highest, I, I pulled our, that up. Yeah. Where most people buy three to 400 K. So right here, well, right now, Texas home values, the median is 296, 582. So that you're pretty much on the money. That's three yeah. to 400. And I'm uh, talking really San Antonio Metro. And this will give us a little bit more of the statistics of that uh, in itself. But I think this is all of Texas, uh, whereas we want to look at just San Antonio. Maybe it'll let us. Here we go. Uh, let's go San Antonio, Texas. Okay, so, and another thing I have to tell you. There we is, go. So there's your San Antonio at 253, which makes sense, actually. Um, has increased, and are these sold, or is this So, so let's, let's stop here for a second. Okay. Okay, let's stop, all right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't like using Zillow or right. any website for statistics because it's horrible for providing stats and and why that is is because texas is a non-disclosure state correct right which means that they don't get the sold even though they do they, right? they do they, from mls they do but you're really not supposed to be publishing it publicly this sold correct. information that's through mls but they don't get it through mls they they, they, get, they it, get it through uh, uh if an agent puts it on there. Core logic. Oh, core logic. And they also own uh showing time. Right? Sure. Right, right? Things like yep. that. So they're getting information that that way. I I believe they still own it. They bought it out. Right. So, anyways, it's still really poor. And that's why when you go to those estimates Correct. on Zillow, it'll show what star rating per city that the accuracy is for a estimate. And, ah. and if you go to that, just if you type in Google, you can type in Zillow's estimate rating. And you'll see most Texas cities are like no stars at all because it's a non-disclosure, you know. Because uh, they don't really state. know. They don't know. They're just taking a right? guess. So how accurate. Uh, but you actually actually go down, down. Zillow's uh, this one right accuracy, here? The lower, down one more. Right there, that one. It's the Zillow accurate. website up top, up top. This one? Up top. Right up top. there. There you go. Boom. Okay, right. so this is going to say... It says the Zestman home value uh, valuation model and Zillow estimate uh, estimate of... Home value market values. The Zestimate incorporates public MLS and user submitted data into Zillow's. Uh, prop, uh, there we go. But, but our MLS doesn't do it. So go down. Accuracy of listing per state. Here you go. So, there. so check out Austin. See see the accuracy. Uh, Austin. Okay. Let's see here. So it says median for error, but they used they used to have a star rating. Okay. Gotcha. And within twenty percent of sales price. 98.6%. They used to have a star rating when they did okay. this. And I see if you why go, they switched go, to Go this. to states. Let's go to Let's Texas. see what state says now. So go to Texas and I, see. I, I would guarantee most agents don't even know that this exists. So this is, see, look they have, that. they have, a, and look within 5% of sales price, 78.98%. I mean, that's a pretty big disparity yes, still even there. For sure. But they used to have a star rating and there were zero stars. We're so, at least 20%, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's not that great, <laughs> right? No, it's so, not. I wouldn't use right, this we go for back data, to Austin. but now go back to Sabor Market Stats okay. when you can. I hate to have you keep pulling no, up no, the screen. This is what it's here for. But go back this to go back to December. Go back to December. Okay. And look. this is not all of Texas, but you can pull it up per board, right? Yeah. So now go down. Okay. Go down, down, down to the very bottom. Very, very bottom. There you go. Okay. Up. 
there you go. Now look at the sales per price point right here. Mm -hmm. Look at three to 400. Uh, that's our, that's our sweet spot. So look how many sales compared yep. to everything else. Yep. So is Zillow right? Good point. Good point. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the, uh, di look, 610. Yeah. Compared to where Zillow is saying 250, 425 to 299. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that. But, but I will go as far as to say that data, um, it's all in the way that you calculate whatever it is that you have. So, I mean, True. technically, if they total these up, there's 24, 10 in purchases um, by all of them. And then the lowest and the highest, that's how they get the averages. It, the average, you can you see 25.3%. 20, you know, right. And they, they show on weekly stats what the yeah. medium and, and uh, you know, the average sales price is. No, on that makes stats. sense. That, so you can see. But that's so good stuff. Look at months of inventory. You're saying low supply. It's yeah. there. Where let's see per here. price point months of inventory to the very right days on market months of inventory gotcha well now okay correct me if I'm wrong but your post or or above million dollar price point has always been higher than all the others matter of fact it used to be at almost two years worth of inventory there it's gone down and Boom. when we look at let's call it our sweet spot of inventory it's still at 4.3 months um which it's going to take a lot of inventory to it's increase totally. that month it yeah, has so, been I mean, increasing though it has we hope so it I mean, has. Uh, definitely it's, we need it i follow it every month almost okay. and it has been increasing it actually went down a little bit uh -huh. uh, like the past couple months but it was increasing for the majority of the year because rates were so high right, right? so what's a healthy supply that people say uh, i would say about a healthy is around 4 they, 4 months they say months. 6 months 6 months is actually like when the tipping supply. point of it becoming a seller's market versus a buyer's market they and i mean if it can stay right around the six 5 months. 6 mark that's that's supposed to be a fair market it's not horrible. No, you know not at saying? all. It's not, not at all. Not like some other markets where they have them. And can, can you, I'll let you explain what, how, how did they, what is considered a healthy supply when, when they say four months or five months, what does that mean? What that means is if there were no new listings coming to market whatsoever, it would take this amount of months if we had that type of buyer to get rid of these homes essentially That's exactly right. and, and that being the case, I mean, I love that we're talking about this stuff because it almost brings light to the conundrum of what is being plastered everywhere that there's no affordable housing. And I call BS on that. I think that it's almost our mindset as a buyer as to what we want in our wish list, because it is still based off of the concept of 2020, 2021 prices and rates and sure. values and everything else. So let's talk about that right now, yeah. right? Because people are still... And, and this is my opinion of why the premium market hasn't taken off as fast as it should, because people are still in that 2020 to 2022 mindset of my home is worth gold, right? Yep. And now they're kind of getting brought back down to reality that it's, it's not that it's, they're, they're still homes, right? And we right. got to, we got to get back down to kind of where we were. So if you look at the stats up there and I hate to pull them up again, but no, it's fine. close to original list price. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Look at that. Where where do you see that one? Right close here. to original so list price. So that's okay. what they're listed at and what they're closing for. The highest one is 94%. So people are taking 6% yeah. cuts and that's not even showing closing costs and other this, factors. This actually is including closing costs because closing costs is one of the things that goes into the appraisal, the value, all of those things. I, I don't so know if Sabor includes closing costs in this. Yeah, they've got to be getting it from like, for example, an appraiser, same concept. They use the MLS which they explain that they use MLS in part of this. So they've got to calculate that into it. That's something I don't know if, if they are actually using that. If they are great, that now, would be huge. Another so. good point that you raise here is when people say values are going to drop, I don't agree. I have to correct them and say sales prices will drop. drop. Why? Because you went too high and you're out of the range for most, or you're still expecting too much for your home. I mean, me in my situation, I would love to sell my house right now. Uh, honestly, we every three years we changed houses. We've been doing it since back in the day, and we've made a good chunk of change doing that. But right now, what we're faced with is if we sell, how the heck are we going to find another home like we have or even close to it that compares on a monthly payment concept um, to what we have now? 
it's like we would have to go backwards to a certain extent, which I'm perfectly fine with. I mean, honestly, I'm I'm like, hey, babe, Kristen, let's uh let's go backwards, find another fixer upper, fix it up, live in it three years, sell it again, make the chunk of change. But uh, once you have that lifestyle, it's hard to go back. Now, I think that I think that folks out there are willing to not necessarily drop their price because we're seeing every contract that I've had for the last goodness, at least two months is coming with closing cost, even in multiple offer situations. So it's like all of the multiple offers they received, they were asking for closing cost also. So it's almost one of those typical standard what's going on in the market right now. Listing agents are informing their buyers. If you want to sell this, you got to give up money on the backside. It doesn't have to be on the price. Compete with the builder. Correct. Correct. Um, So yeah, I mean, that's, that's good stuff. So basically... I guess let me ask the question again. Is there an affordability issue or is there a expectations issue? I think you got to dive deeper into it and go back to these stats here. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't understand that 6% is a lot on a $300,000 home. That's 18 grand Absolutely. that people are having to give up just to sell the $300,000 home. Yeah. Right. And I just tell when I have a listing, I tell my clients, unless your home is the cream of the crop, you know, sharpest tool in the shed, broadest crown in the box. It, I used to be able to say it's probably going to sell in this amount of time, right? Right. And this, it's average this amount of time. Now I have to tell people it's either going to be on the market for a week or it could take six months. Like you Unless just don't you're willing know to drop your price to, drop to what price. somebody's yeah. willing to pay. And and yeah. prices are being reduced and they mm-hmm. are taking less money. If the stats don't lie, they right. are right. They really are. And then. On top of that, you know, they're on the market for longer than they right. were. You know, when you look at your average GOM, you're you're hitting 90 days on some of these. Yeah. You know, where a month back it was How far days. back does Sabor go? Because I would Over love to uh I would love to pull this same data up for a 2008, 2009, 2010. That, I don't it think would, you would have to go It would be to totally Sabor. flipped. It'd be you know? it'd be huge to go back that far, but yeah. I mean you know, when you're looking at these stats, you're saying, is there an affordability issue? I think one of the bigger problems is, is if you bought in the last three years, uh-huh. you might be upside down, right? There's a very good chance where you could be upside down because if you're having to take 6%, right, and reduce it 6%, and then you have potentially 6% in realtor fees and right. another 1.5% in closing costs, you know, you're looking at somewhere upwards of like 13 to 14%. Well, but would you go as far home? as to say as anybody that buys in... And then tries to sell within a three year period is going to lose money re- regardless, other than the past 2020 through 20. Yes. And simply yes. because we, we right. have to look back and go, all right, Texas typically has about a five to 6% uh, return uh, um, uh, increase year over year of our value historically. Over the last three years, it was 30%. So if you take each of the years, total it up, it's about 30% increase. That's a substantial amount of equity in three years that you gained. Jeez. Now, that's not normal by any means. So for someone to go into the con- to, to the uh, idea of purchasing a home and thinking that they can flip it or sell it within three years and make money, that's just the wrong way to look at it. You're, you're not an investor. And I think that first-time buyers uh, feel as though they can invest the system if that makes sense like i want to flip this house no 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 no. you need to acquire hold the house uh i think it's not yes number one it's important when you buy the house and how much you buy it for but it's also important how long you hold the property and we used to tell people when we first got in the business you got to own a home for three to five years just to break minimum that's right. right when you when you go sell it but then we had the boom time and you could make a lot of money that's right in 2023 you didn't see those that five percent increase right so Unfortunately, 2023 is a pretty flat year when mm-hmm. you look at, at stats. You didn't gain a lot of equity. Some some people did lose money in their home from really? 2021 to 22, especially in new builds. Well, new, in new see, builds. now we're talking a different yeah. language, okay? Yeah, because with pre-owned, builds. and that is a rebuttal that I have for any customer that mm-hmm. says we may sell within the next two to five years. Okay, great. Then let's stop talking about new construction sure. because if you realistically want to... um save money and you're so interested in what interest rates you get and all that stuff, hear me out on this. If you go to sell in two years, three years, five years, and that builder is still building out their community, who are you competing with? 
could be the building. The builder and stuff. It's you re- know, it's really tough. So yeah. you can't. I don't. Th- we are talking in apples to oranges. If you're doing, I don't think anybody in San Antonio lost money in equity year over year in 2023 on a pre-owned home. I just. All you got to do is look at the taxes. Pro- probably not too much. <laughs> I think they stayed pretty flat Pro- in on it, a pre-owned. On new I would even say they still went up. Gained gained a little bit. Now, the stats are there. Who's <laughs> control? Who's, they're there. Well, that's. Yeah, they're there. You can look and see. see. So go to this. Does it show that? Uh, if you go back to the the main page. And okay. I hate, like I hate that we're having to navigate no, while that's we're okay. doing this. But There's you got to go uh, to the main page. Go back to uh, Sabor Market. Oh, gotcha. Page. Okay. Can you go to that? Yep. Boom, we're over here. So let's do this. Go down. Okay. Uh, or sorry, go back one more time and then go to go to weekend sales. Okay. Do weekend that. sales. Weekend sales. How far back can we go on that? Go down. How far oh, back? Oh, pretty far. There, there you go. What are we at there? That's so, July. There you go. So July of 23. So look at the the medium and the average sales price and then go to now. Okay. 327, 397. Sales price. So, Sales you price. said it. Sales Aver- average price. Average sales price. Okay. And medium sales price. Average and medium. Let's now go see. up top. Look, you see the values that are going down. And then it kind of goes up a little bit. And then we're- And then look. Yeah, but I, I don't think that that quite dictates a it home value fully. drop because it's still home sales. So it's whatever you have on the market that goes into that number, whatever bracket the home buyers are buying in goes into that number, not the homeowners. Um, I, you know what? Let's just, let's do this as well for the last little just check. Now, thank goodness for Congress and, and our, uh, Senator and everybody else, because it doesn't matter what property you put into this County appraisal. We all got a discount on our taxes, substantial hundred grand off of the school tax portion of it. Um, let's use, uh, my old house, 8426 stone chase. I like, uh, I like using this one cause it pains me every time knowing that I sold it too soon. So if we go to the value roll of this property, we've got, I mean, small increase right there, Austin. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not incorrect, uh, but not, not also but fully small. correct. Now, go back to us, JC. I will say, and let's see if you agree with me on this, new home construction determines more of the actual market than people think in Ex- regard explain to- explain okay so explain if what you mean. if we are low in existing home pre-existing homes the only market we have to turn to is new construction well comps are based on a radius uh around that actual property that's being sold so if they're using that as their marker, the only comps are the c- new construction homes within that community and and maybe right outside of it. What it does is it either helps or hurts the pre-existing homes that are around there. But the good news for consumers is pre-owned homes have go- gone through the ebbs and flows of the market. So they're pretty stable in regards to that. It's always the new construction that's taking the risk in that new area or territory that they open up in hopes that they sell it for X price. Sure. Gosh, I remember sure. uh, we were looking out in, uh, what is that, Miralomo, Mira, Miraposa, uh, 46 and uh, I-10 Mira, and 46, Miraloma. Miraloma. Mira Dude, they built some so. million dollar homes in that neighborhood that sat for years. And that happens. That happens. They picked the wrong spot type concept, but- I do think that the needle being moved has a lot to do with new home sales, which I'm all for them keeping the prices up and doing what they're doing on the back end, because then it it doesn't hurt the person that just bought recently. Well, and you look at appraisals all the time, but mm-hmm. we both know appraisers don't like to compare pre-owned to new, right? Oh, or, correct. Or vice versa. They only they use like their to. own. You're right. Yeah, that's that's so it doesn't affect it as much as you would think. But I mean, I've seen them where they like have to yeah. sometimes, right? And that's rare. Like they don't, they don't like to. to so do. using your reference here, and I just thought of it, JC, go back to reference. Going to use this reference here. Uh, where was go down. the you're going, number? You're going year over year. Is that what you're looking at? Yep. Yeah, yep. Go down. Where'd it go? Right there. There. Okay, good. So we're looking at a drop in 23% 
Oh, sorry. Single yeah, family, same thing. Go, single same family, twenty three percent compared to thirty nine percent, and an increase of thirty nine percent. And tell me that they're not the ones that are driving the market. Okay, they are now. Now, <laughs> okay. So hang on. So before we go off on a, a tangent too much on this, and we focus too much time on this, let's look at one other thing. Pull up the next sheet, and I want to show you what happened in okay. January. Oh, the next month. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first time I saw this is in January compared to all of 2023. Look what happened. Okay. So we come over here. I hit the back button. You you already downloaded it. Remember? It's oh, be, smart yeah, man. Yeah. Smart man. Gosh, ladies and gentlemen, I love <laughs> a smart man. Let's see here. Let pull that up. <laughs> okay. So this should be the correct one. Yeah. So check out January and go down and look at, look at your year over year for January. There is our year to date. Is this the same as mm -hmm. the year? Okay, perfect. Now look at the difference. Okay, it's coming back, but still a large disparity. But we're talking negative 23. That's a positive difference. Four. Huge like we, difference. I noticed a massive boost in pre-owned sales yeah. in January. And look, uh, you know, you got your, your new construction going down. Yeah, you went from negative bit. 23 to 4% and people would go, oh, that's not, no, that's a substantial difference. If if I look back, I think that's, this is the first month in all, from all of 2023 that it's in the positive. Oh, wow. For year over year. Wow. First month. Okay. So that's a, a huge thing that I wanted to make clear to everyone. That's the first time I saw that in a year. And mm. I think this is a great point that we should not be so hung up in monthly, weekly statistics. We've got to continue to take a bird's eye view when you're looking at things like this, because a home is not a short term asset unless you're flipping properties. Uh, but even in this market, it'll take you a couple months to get that thing flipped. <laughs> sure. No, well, and flipping ain't easy. That's my yeah. saying here in San Antonio. It's there you go. Easy. So home affordability, final thoughts. I think that we're still not where we need to be. So as in regards to affordability. So I, and I, do you think it's an inventory issue or a price issue? It's a rate issue. Okay. It's I, a rate I, issue. I can't, I yeah, can't, it's, well, it's, it's a that. combination of a price and rate issue. Yeah. And so, we know our prices aren't going to go down though. Well, let's, let's talk about the big, um, the big thing that everyone says, right? Okay. So, and this is just my opinion. Oh, don't so say it. Marry the rate. Date the, no, okay, no. Good. That everyone says, <laughs> well, back in the eighties, interest rates were 18%. You guys don't know how good you have it at six and a half, seven percent Yeah. Right? Tell me when the last time you so, bought a $20,000 exactly. house. Exactly. <laughs> so that's key. And that's how we ended up in our, our issue with our big problem today is that Prices increased to 300% mm -hmm. in such a short period of time. And then the rates went up more than double of what they right. were. And that was the perfect storm to create unaffordability. You're exactly that correct. Is, that is the whole issue. So it really doesn't matter what rates were in the 80s. Yes, they were way, way higher and you were paying a ton of interest, but homes were so much cheaper. Yeah. And the fact that they're so much more expensive now and the rates just even, like I said, doubled. It right. creates a huge disparity in affordability where people, they just can't afford it. They just can't. I think the last thing that I want people to know with this, this part of the discussion is I don't care what state you go to. If you type in home values over time, um, we don't need the reference. Over time and you zoom out on the map, it's always like this. Yeah, it Meaning, is. Meaning no is. matter what, it's going to eventually come up. So it's what it, what is that saying where it's um basically any time you buy real estate you win as long as you can hold it long enough it's not it's not it's there's a saying it's that, true it's true as long as you can hold it but sometimes you have to hold it a while right, right. especially from 2008 yep. right i had when i was helping people yep. cuz we you know i got in right before the the whole mortgage sure. crisis and housing bubble burst and i remember helping people that bought in 2004, 2005, like right at the peak, yeah. right? And they still were upside down at like 2012, 2013. Now, now let's also add into there what added to them being upside down. Well, they were mainly VA and they had zero equity going in and then they, they had funding fee on top of that, right? Which was rolled in. And so that, you're yeah. on the money there. Yeah, so now what was happening also that was massively is people were doing 80, 20 loans and no money down. So sure. if you go in with no equity, what's your return on that? Uh, matter of fact, there was a, uh, a presentation that we gave uh, this last week at a uh, uh, title company. And it was a concept that I really hadn't thought about in a while or for some odd reason didn't think about it. But we were talking about return on investment. And consumers, realtors, we're all typically trained to think, okay, if I buy a house for 200000 
and I sell it uh, a year later for uh, two hundred and twenty thousand. I only made ten percent in on my money. Well, no. How much did you put in it to it to buy? Well, I, it was a hundred percent financing. Well, then you actually made like three hundred thousand percent on your money because you didn't buy the house cash. <laughs> So sure. you were only out your down payment. If you paid closing costs, no problem. But that return is based on what you put in. It's, it's return on investment. So if you didn't invest anything into it, your actual return is massive. And nobody thinks to, about that uh, uh, concept in itself. Well, I, I think you can look at it that way when mm -hmm. you're comparing renting to, to buying, right? It's sure. Because if you, if you put the money to rent, you're never getting it back. That's right. And, and the way I tell people, it's like, it's like playing basketball without ever taking a shot. So mm. when you buy a home, at least you're in the game and you have the chance to make a shot. Yeah. But when you rent, you, there's no way you're getting your money That's back. That's right. And, and buying is not for everyone. It ties you down. You're more committed, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just up and leave. And when something breaks, you got to fix it, That's right? That's right. Unless it's like a new home. There's some negatives to, to buying over renting. But I agree with what you said. If you finance the whole thing and then you make money, yes, you're, you're making more, right? And that that comes into play, but there's also other factors. And what I tell even all of our agents, real estate is just math. It's, yeah. it's math. If you yeah. know the math and you know how to do the math, then you can really figure out, did I really make money? And I think that that's what we as professionals should be bringing to light to our customers uh, because the, the, the journey of purchasing a home tends to bring a lot of emotion into it. it it's... Uh, my forever home. Everybody thinks that this home is their forever home. Um, it, you make a lot of memories there, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to make sure that we sit our customers down and go over the math, the the, the, the sure. numbers. The numbers need to to number. You know, the math needs to math. Well, let's let's break it down real quick. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's do it real fast. Let's say you, let's make it really easy. You bought a home for a hundred k. Okay. Okay. You sell it. Let's say five years later for okay. a hundred twenty. That would be really good. Okay. How much did you put down? Okay. Let's say that, let, let's actually, let's make it 110. You okay. sell it for 110. Okay. Okay. So you make 10% five years later. Okay. Let's say you put down. So let's you, say you put down. You think that, okay, keep going. Yeah. Let's say you put down 5%. Okay. Okay. So you put, so down, you put down 5 grand. You put down 5K. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you got 5K. So you really 95K on your note, right? Correct. 95K on your note. Yep. But then there's other factors like closing costs, right? Lender fees, sure. things like that, and that you, you do have still, to consider. You could still calculate that into that concept. Mm -hmm. Let's say you paid all of your closing sure, costs. Sure, let's say you paid all of them. So let's say- Let's say three and a half percent. Or uh, make it, you want to make well, it simple? Yeah, 3%, make it simple. We'll say, we'll say you put 5% down and the closing costs were five. Uh, so Which would be 10 K total. 10 K. Right? Okay. Let's so you bought it for a hundred grand. You put in a hundred grand. I'm sorry, you put in 10 grand okay, you put and in you 10. sold it for 110. You sold it for 110. Okay, but then you have to pay you made six, six and a half percent to sell it, right? Yeah. With another one and a half percent on average of closing okay. costs. So seven and a half percent to sell it, right? Yeah. Okay. So you broke even with the first scenario, but then with the fees to sell the home, mm -hmm. you actually lost money. Okay. That doesn't include principal that you put down, right? Mm -hmm. As over the time you paid over five right. years, the principal that was reducing. Now the, we're using we're using an example it's, that's not logical because you'd probably recommend them not to sell. Hey, let's you would look recommend at, they don't right. sell, but that is a big misconception but that people. You're also missing the concept that they put ten grand in. If they can sell it for one ten, they made a hundred percent on their money. How do you figure a hundred percent? I've only put ten grand in. If you're yes. going to give me twenty thousand back, you're saying they made ten, right? So if they bought for a hundred, put five in. Uh huh. Okay. Take closing costs. All that I stuff understand what you're saying. They made a hundred percent over. But they made a hundred percent. But when of their you investment. break down the math, they didn't. They didn't, uh, and that's the truth. They didn't. Okay. Every scenario is going to be different, ladies and gentlemen. Every mm -hmm. scenario. Now, I would hope that anybody in that situation that needs to sell, um, got some great memories out of the property. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> you know. I mean, well, and again, that's another thing. You got to use it the way that you wanted. You didn't right. have to contact the landlord if you wanted to paint the walls. Yep. You did. You, you know, you had a yard maybe where you went yep. with an apartment, right? And for your dog to yeah. to run in or what? what you got all and the other six percent, man. Another discussion. Are realtors making too much? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they are. No, <laughs> so, that's that's know. good stuff. We, on and the, we we did go over that over we the did, first one. How much did. they how much they really come out with? Right? Correct. So. 
I mean, you it's know, not you as really much as you would think, guys. Yes, you have to break it down. So home affordability, we scratched that off the table. Um, Texas versus the other states that are out there. I mean, obviously, we can only speak to what happens in Texas. Matter of fact, we can only speak to what happens almost just in San Antonio and surrounding. But from a conceptual standpoint, real estate is always about location. It is very dependent upon where you're doing the data, digging, what location you're actually looking into. And what I don't like seeing on the media is it being painted as an overall picture of everything. Example, uh, I did a, uh, a discussion with uh, JJ and Andy about mm-hmm. commercial real estate, whereas the whole United States is about to crumble with commercial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, here in San Antonio, they're doing great. Really? affordability uh the vacancy rate isn't as as high as it is all over the united states uh companies are moving here whether it's political reasons tax re- whatever but they're busy whereas everybody else is not and they're more experts in that field sure. so see and i i didn't know that and that's mm-hmm. that's i mean that's good to know that i didn't hard. either that's why i had them because it was like dude treat me like i'm an infant i know nothing about commercial lay it on me so it was a good discussion so that i mean that's good i mean san antonio's growing right it has businesses coming here it mm-hmm. has people wanting to to a business and and you know contribute to the the market here you know and yeah the overall overall culture which is good. I mean, look at us. We're doing the same thing, right? It's true. So we're running a space. I mean, I don't know enough about other states. Yeah. I do know other states are doing better than us here. Very few. Right? Mm-hmm. Texas does really. Texas does really well in general, even right. during the the housing bubble burst. And I have to attribute a lot of that to affordability because it is more affordable mm-hmm. than a lot of states. Um, you know, we have maybe less strict laws when it comes to taxes. So sure. we got tax shelters here where people want to come over. Mm-hmm. And then the other big thing is, especially San Antonio, we're military city USA. We That's have right. a huge influx of people coming in and out. We have five bases, not that there's actually people in all five bases, but there's a big influx of people PCSing in and out all the time. So you have a good steady influx and outflow of people that want to buy and sell and own and be part of the American dream and own their house. Yeah. So that's a big thing that keeps our market steady here. And, and in general, Texas overall, you know, people, people come, we got a lot of bases in Texas. I think there's, so. there's a lot of factors, kind of how you put it. There's a lot of factors that make Texas, San Antonio surrounding, um, I don't want to say a safe, but a very secure bet when it comes to real estate, because there's just so much bent that we benefit from on the real estate opportunity, affordability, uh, bases, you're going to have steady inflow. I mean, there's just so many factors that you can use to help someone understand that real estate in Texas is pretty safe. I mean, as far as investment, as far as tucking your money away, or at least I could say throwing money at something and hoping you get something back. That I would have to agree. Yeah. I, would have to agree. I think one of the biggest factors to that is that Texas is so big and what what really helps keep the market steady is really what real estate is, which is land, land, land. acquisition. And we have so much of it That's right. that still it's, undeveloped. It's not like states where there is no more land. So they have to tear something down to mm-hmm. put something new up. And that's why the land is so freaking expensive. It's true. You know, in those states. And we did see a huge increase in land value mm-hmm. over the past five. I mean, big increase right. in land value. I remember I remember showing someone like 10 acres like seven years ago mm-hmm. and you could get 10 acres for like 50 K and now you're lucky to get it for like 150. It's true. You know, it's, that's crazy. You know, 10 years or seven years difference and that, that increase, that's insane. So it has gone up. I mean, of course, extreme rural, it's still fairly, you can get acres still fairly right. cheap, but if you want to be close to a major Metro and have convenience, you're going to pay more money. So yeah. land, yes, that is huge. That's another reason why we're in my opinion, more affordable and more secure with values. I would agree a hundred percent with that. Actually, mm-hmm. um, let me see real quick. Three thirty, Daniel Lee. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's keep going. Okay, so now, if we were to talk investor, I've invested in real estate. You've invested in real estate. What would be your thoughts from a perspective of? first time investor getting into the market opportunities that there are in our market for investing. Um, and the reason why I prompt this is half of the deals that I'm doing right now and for the last three months 
have been folks that already own a home and are wanting to buy another one. And, mm. and in many cases are not really inclined to sell the current because of the terms that they have on it. Maybe it's a lower rate, et cetera, et cetera. So they want to become first time investors, you know, time to flip that property to a, 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 an investment property and buy my next home. I think it depends on what they're going to do with the property because there's so many different ways to invest in real estate. Mm-hmm. And by no means am I an expert. Yes, I've invested, but I'm not an expert in it. I Here's what I tell people, especially if they want to keep their existing home and become a landlord. Mm-hmm. I tell them that not everyone is cut out to be a landlord. And here are the main reasons why. Mm-hmm. Because when things go wrong, right, or you have vacancies or a tenant dips out on you or you have repairs, you got to be ready to drop and be able to drop potentially thousands on the drop of a dime on that home that is your your rental, okay? And then most people don't know how to property manage it themselves, so they have to hire a property management company, which is also going to be more fees. And unless you have a good cushion, more than likely, you know, you're going to be in a bad spot when those things happen. So you got to be prepared for when those things go south if you're planning to do a long-term buy and hold, right? right. So it's different if you flip and there can be a lot of money made in the flip market and in the rehab market here. Um, I still say it's not as easy as other locations, you know, in in America or, you know, across the U.S. I agree. Yeah. I would still say it's not as easy because the margins just aren't there. Right. And there's a lot of other factors that go into play. But the really good investors, and I've been to some of their seminars, they have all these incredible tools mm-hmm. to figure out, hey, is this going to be, you really have to do your research. Like, is this going to be profitable for me Absolutely. To, to be able to put this money in and get the money that I want out of it, you yeah. know? And I will tell you, like, I think that is key. If you're planning to do a flip, you have to have access to those tools. Oh, 100%. If you don't have access to those tools, you're going to be behind the curve from all those guys that do. And they have some incredible algorithms. Actuaries, yeah, absolutely. Web, web, you know, data websites, I mean, where they know what's coming up before it even comes up and they can go get it before other, you know, investors do. And the investor market, it is insane. Yeah. It is flooded right now. I mean, the reason I bring that up is because you've got home buyers that are, We'll call it complaining about affordability. Meanwhile, you've got massive companies that are bat- not batting a single eye in buying up multiple properties so that they can turn them into investment properties. And you know what? You don't want to buy? Rent from me. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. I mean, not not even just buying up the property. They'll loan you the money, mm-hmm. right? Uh, right? To go get, I mean, every every aspect of investing, even in notes, right? Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll loan you the money to make interest. Oh, yeah. So- I don't know. To me, it's it has to be risk versus reward, especially on a flip, is pretty high. Yeah, depending on what you're doing, right? So you really got to be prepared. Like you're taking a big risk with a lot of money to maybe not get as much of a return. And as long as you know what you're doing, then usually you're good to go. It's so true. It is true. Doing. No. So. Well, that's good for that one. And then I've got uh, actually two more questions. So. You tell me which one you want to talk about first. We're either going to talk briefly about relationship business versus marketing on social media, and I'll expand on that, or we'll talk about the fact that there are more single ladies in the United States that own real estate than single men. Let's do that one last. Do that <laughs> so, one last. Okay, good yeah, deal. So- I want you to I want you to to start this one out and tell me what which you think. one relationship uh, yeah business versus marketing on social so social media. I think that they can be parlayed because there there's two schools of thought okay I'm, or there's probably many but my opinion there's two schools of thought where I've got people that say nope it's a relationship business I don't do social media I I, I meet people I go out in the community I I go to church all, all of those things. I don't disagree with you on that part, but the idea of you not having a social media presence is stone age. You, you are behind the curve. Now, I believe that you can utilize social media to leverage the relationship piece to it, meaning you don't, your customer that you've never met before, because we know if you, if we all did business with our friends only, we'd all be broke. So we've got to meet new people constantly. But when we meet those people, I don't want to say infiltrate their lives, but 
become part of what they do, become a staple in their everyday lives that they don't forget who you are because you're the guy that they go to to get recommendations for handyman, yep. recommendations for AC. Hey, I, I got this bill in the mail. Can you tell me what this is? Be that person, if that makes sense. So here, all I can do is tell you what's worked for me yeah. because I don't know. Now, I'll tell you the reason why I ask you this is you aren't as uh, present on social media as others would be, but are still very successful. Okay. So again, I'll tell you what's worked for me and it's like, it, it's exactly what you said. So on social media, I am present. Mm -hmm. Like I post my closings, right? Yep. And of course, happy clients and then some of my listings and things like that. Mm -hmm. I do, but I'm not, I'm not out there all the time filming homes from builders and posting. I mean, you can only look at a home so many times that are like, I've seen that, you know, it's a house, it's right. a house, right? right. So you got to be a little more unique than that. And that's what you see a lot of younger agents doing right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're just trying to get their startup sure. going, but you know, you want to make it somewhat creative and somewhat engaging like what did they say you got 20 seconds that's to right. capture something if even now, now it's, it's like six six yep. seconds right yep. so got shows like coco melon that kids are watching where it's flipping the scene every <laughs> two so seconds true. right yes so right that's what they've drilled in you it has to change fast so what's worked for me is that i'm extremely blessed to have clients that trust me mm -hmm. and because i i take really good care of them and they're all amazing incredible people mm -hmm. i'm so thankful for them that i've I've learned that if you learn to build a referral business, you don't have to market near as much, mm -hmm. right? Because you just take really good care of the people who trust in you right, to take care of them. And then they in turn want to send you their friends, their family, their, their coworker, because you took really good care of them. Correct. Right. So if you can learn how to do that, you don't have to market a bunch, but if you do both, that's even better. Even better. Right. Yeah. It's even better. But again, I think it, we talked about being confident and cocky or mm -hmm. arrogant right yeah. so it depends on how you want to come across and i don't want to come across as that because i'm not that Correct. i just i'm here to help if you want my help and again i just have to reiterate I, not just my clients my you know business partners like you and everyone else i'm so incredibly thankful for people like you and them that that they trust me with like we said the biggest decision that they're making Absolutely. financial decision that they're making in their whole entire life mm -hmm. ever 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 it's such a big deal that like I said, most realtors don't realize that. Like it is such a blessing and an opportunity for you. Anytime someone comes to you and asks for your help, it's huge. I mean, they're putting so much faith in you as an individual that if you have that mentality, then you'll be fine. You'll be okay. So yeah. that is what's worked for me, you know, and I do need to up my social media presence and you'll see that more. It's sure. coming, right? Because sure. we have the, the new brokerage opening. So yeah. I have to do that. So it's coming, but Again, I just don't want to come across as that guy that just shoves stuff down your throat. Sure. All the time, you know, so, and you'll notice like they do all kinds of studies on these big YouTubers and stuff. And yeah. sometimes the guys that are, and the gals that are most successful are the ones who just produce really good content and they dish it out, you know, to their every team. now and then, mm -hmm. you know, every now and then it's, but it's really good. It's good right. stuff instead of just pumping out a bunch of stuff at. Yeah. At and I, and I have to agree with you, like all the videos of houses and things. Yes. That. We know homes are sexy. That's yeah. what sells at the end of the day. But uh, what value did you bring to them? Because that Try. home that you just showed, guarantee you, it's not even for sale anymore. No, not for sale. Or it's not even <laughs> or your they listing. Can't buy it. It's <laughs> not your listing. You have no no affiliation with it whatsoever, Correct. right? I mean, so what value? And yeah, they might call you because they saw the home and that does work. Sure. It does work. They'll mm -hmm. call you because they saw the home working. Like, I want to buy this house, mm -hmm. you know, and then you can pick them up as a client. But then you have to know what to do with them after. Correct. So, and if you don't know what to do with them after, then what value are you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I like that. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've got last on the docket and then you can, you can talk about whatever you want. Talk about you. Oh Lordy. Here we go. Mm -hmm. So we've got, uh, let's see if I can find this article. Uh, Wait, say it. What's, what's the subject line? And then tell, tell everyone what I said to you when you, when you said that. ladies own more real estate than single men i type that in and this article is like everywhere and when i read this topic i was like wow i didn't know that and then what did i say to you it's probably because of divorce <laughs> it's probably because they're the ones who ended up with the home after with the, the divorce <laughs> so but that's just a joke it so is a joke it you is guys a joke. yeah uh, we believe women are powerful and wouldn't uh God, we wouldn't be here without them, to be honest. Absolutely. That's and a literal fact. There are a lot of extremely successful single women 
So right. let's let's so, talk about a homeowner gender gap. Single women own more homes than single men. It says uh, women typically lag behind men in pay. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, women's median weekly earnings are only 83 percent of a man's. While research generally indicates women are less well off financially than men, one key area in which women are likely to uh, to fare better uh, men in home ownership. Uh, lending tree, yada, 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 all of 50, 57 out of, uh, 47 out of 50 states. Our study also finds that single women own 2.71 million more homes than single men. That is a big number. Uh, and I think they actually have, yeah, I mean, 2.71. That's that's quite a bit. Okay. Back to us. What are your thoughts on that? Because so I, I can tell this, you my thought, but I want to hear this first. This is a touchy subject. It so really you gotta be is. Careful how you how you talk about this, but I, from what I've experienced in, from everyone I've helped, right? Yeah. Which you too, which is like thousands of people. Um, it seems like a lot of times, and I don't want to say all the time, but especially when it's uh, a marriage, at least at the start or even after, women a lot of times they handle the finances. Yeah, like and they know how to be financially sound. And I would savvy. even go as far as to say a little bit more responsible too. A little more responsible. <laughs> yeah. I, I would have to agree. They are, mm-hmm. um, especially single women with children. Yeah. They like, <laughs> they have a gift I, of multi. I tell them all like the time, business. like yes. y'all are incredible, super women, yeah. super moms. Like, I don't know how you do it. Yeah. You know, knowing having children myself, how you do it and then still work and then own a home and have kids. And it is just yeah. so much to juggle. Right. And the fact that they can do that. And it's proven women are better That's at right. multitasking than men. It's true. They I mean, really I are. will tell you so, out of 10 credit reports that I pull that there's a man and a woman on it, the lady's credit score is always better. Better. I mean, and you see those all the time. I see it all you the know, time. You see them all the time. So yep. I would say- I that, always make a joke about it, but I mean, it, it is true. Just mm-hmm. like this statistic here that we're looking at, that's true as well. I mean, what what would you say to men out there? I know what I'd say. I'd say, men, step it up. Yeah, step up at, again. At the end of the day, step it up. I'm not saying we need to be better than women, anything like that. That's not what I'm doing here, but- um, I believe that I'll agree. We had a head start, a big head start. And, uh, it's almost one of those things where you go, gentlemen, take notes, please from the ladies and, and get your stuff together. So this is, this is one thing I could say, think about if you have your stuff together, credit wise, yep. financially owning a home as a man. And then you find a woman that also has that mm-hmm. just a power powerhouse, couple. That's yeah, right. power couple. So if you can do that too, and then you find a woman that also can do that, that's huge, not just for you, but for her. So instead of having her carry you or vice versa, yeah. you know, that's, it's, uh, it just really helps a, a good symbiotic relationship and then also helps you progress with your, with your finances and everything. Absolutely. Else. So if you can do both, right. So get you one that can do both and you're good to go. Yeah, <laughs> you, man, you got it made so, in the shade. You know. Well, that's all the questions that I have. Austin, what do you want to talk about now? We got, uh, we got about, I don't know, 15 minutes. Talk about you. So we talked, we talk a lot about me, but I want you to tell, so we know that you were, were you my, was I your very first deal? Yeah, man. Your very first one. Very first deal. Matter of fact, Marty's daughter was the, uh, the first, was the first closing. Yeah. Speaking of. Martha Flores. Speaking of women who have their oh, exactly stuff together. single lady yeah. owns her home. Her daughter owns yeah. a home, works several jobs, has a degree. You're right, Martha Flores. Yeah. Shout out, yeah, lady. Shout out to you. Keep super, crushing it. Superwoman, incredible That's lady right. that that has her stuff together and really took initiative to I be agree. the amazing person that she is. So, um, so we you were we were we were each other, right? So, anyways, I was the first realtor for your first loan transaction, mm-hmm. and you came out of banking. Yes, right. I, I came out of years of banking, uh, tired of getting paid a salary and giving away uh, great advice, great logic, seeing all the different people coming into the bank, shaking and moving. And here I am managing bank account, checking accounts, stuff like that. Moved into the business banking side, um, started learning annuities, and and still there was very little commission. I worked for Chase. So, I mean, you were getting commission on things like connect their online banking. I'm yeah, like, yeah. come on guys, I want some real, uh, you wanted the sky uh, to be the movers. limit. That's right. You wanted the sky to be the limit. So I jumped into uh, car sales, did that for a little while and then moved over to the finance uh, side was finance manager. And then I wanted more. I mean, honestly, I, that opened my eyes to a hundred percent commission. So you get paid, uh, for your efforts clearly. 
And uh, I went and took all my real estate classes. And before it was time to take the test, I went, this, this isn't for me. Let me see what the finance side looks like. Uh, my mom introduced me to uh, uh, Craig Jennings yeah. over at yeah. Academy. We hit it off that day. Uh, I left his office with the understanding that if I pass this test, he'll hire me. And uh, I did. And he did. And I never looked back. And you're, you excelled right off the get-go, right? I, I mean, did. And you did. And you were like top LO in that office, yeah. right? Uh, so Yeah, I was shit, still top 1%. But I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, yes, I utilized social media. I utilized the relationships. I was honest with customers day one. Um, I would tell them, I don't know the answer to that, but I will find out and I'll get back to you. And, and you I did. did. Yeah. And you did. Um, and you taught me a lot of things, a yeah. whole lot. You know, um, we taught each other stuff, but you taught me more than I taught you. So, uh, <laughs> so why lending over real estate? It's a good why question. Was real man. estate not for you, question. but being a, being an LO was. You it's know, okay. Back, you can back then, hate on realtors. No, if you no, have no. To. I don't, it's, it's, it's nothing against like, hating I don't want to open doors. <laughs> you know, I don't want. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be I driving just, around all the time. What, what I was it? I thought that after I had gone through the real estate classes and talked with Ernie Guerrero again. Yeah. Shout out, Ernie. And um, oh wait, wait, I have to say something. Ernie yeah. was my teacher. That's right. When I first got into real estate yeah, at Sabor, I He's believe one, that he was my favorite teacher He's out of all of them, and taught me a huge majority. He is the best. So Ernie Guerrero is my uncle. Um, uh, previous owner or still owner of Alamo real estate brokers, uh, Michael Guerrero has kind of ran the, the day-to-day operation, but, um, I would, he would allow me to go in there and give presentations to the new, to the business realtors. And, uh, I mean, it was just, I don't know, going through that. I, I knew that I could leverage more of my time and my previous experiences because I had already at 19 uh, opened a credit repair company with a buddy. I had dealt with finance, uh, second chance people when I worked at the bank inside of Walmart. Um, It was always banking. So when I saw the concept of 3% commission, of course, I was attracted to it. But then flipping it over to the lending side, it was like... has nothing to do with going out and showing houses. I just felt like I could help more people with uh, finance numbers, making logic make sense. Um, and and here's another thing that I don't talk about often. Uh, I do to my loan officers, but when loan officers turn in files these days, they turn them in very shittily, mm-hmm. uh, half ass, sloppy. Sloppy, sloppy. Correct. Sloppy. Yeah. When there are guidelines for every single program, every single little everything. But that's a processor job to make them look good. It's not though. You're right. You're exactly right. I'm kidding. So when I got into the business and even right before I got in the business, my mom handed me a massive file. We were doing paper files back then. She was like, this is one file. What are your thoughts on this? And my words were, man, this feels like I would be like an attorney. Awesome. That, yeah. That's what I was thinking. I'm kind like, of. man, I, I get to go reference guidelines. And if I get the right answer, I can actually use it to my advantage to win my case. So that point moving forward, I had like the cleanest files anybody would turn in because I went through everything. Mr. ADD, ADHD, yeah, yeah. that was something that I could focus and on. And then the processor loves you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Matter of fact, my it. processor has become my underwriter in-house for I Think Mortgage. Nice. Cheryl Blum, absolutely. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, and uh, you make it easy for them. Correct. Right? It's like you're handing it to them on a silver platter. doesn't mean they don't have to do work. but it No, they still got to put in work, but yeah. you are correct. And I think that that is something that is shortchanged these days because the loan officer is seen as the salesperson, but they also need to be the person that knows how to do loans. I mean, do you know how to put together a loan? So let's let's talk about, well, and I want to say one other thing. Yeah. When, when we got... When you were in, that's when people still didn't realize how important credit was, Mm -hmm. right? So people didn't have great credit because right right before 2008 and Dodd-Frank, like they didn't care. So you helped so many of my clients, uh, individuals and families that would have never been able to buy a home, get a home because you helped fix their credit. Right. Right. I mean, like it was amazing and you were doing all of it for free. Yeah. Like that's incredible. Right. So what a huge asset and tool for a loan officer to be able to do that. Cause there's a lot of lenders that are like, oh no, we don't do that. We don't do that. I mean, when, when I got into the business, they showed me the tools and I saw the tool as, holy cow, I can use this because of the previous life that I know how to work with credit, what collections are, had the credit repair company back in the day with Mm -hmm. the buddy. Um, that taught us, okay, you can dispute these things, but that's still a, a hope and a prayer. This system shows me if I move this or remove this yep. or do that, it'll be on the money. 
So when I meet with the customer and back then I would meet with them in person and I would emphasize it so much like this is actually what can happen if you do this, this and this. Um, but if you shortchange this, sure. it won't turn out yeah, the right way. Right. And I, I wanted to make sure that they saw actually what was, cause we're all visual people. So if you see it, it feels a- obtainable, achievable. Mm. So, Do you remember what I used to tell him? I, I used to say, I've never seen Mark tell me that, you know, he can fix your credit. And yep. if you do this and that, it that not it, it not work ever. So if you just do what he says, right. it will work. It's not one time has it not worked. That's right. And then it did. Every yeah, time. It still does. Right. Uh, so. and, 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 and I still have those conversations with customers and I'm very direct uh, because this is not something faint of heart. This is not something that is on a whim. If you want the house, this is what you need to do. If you skew from this, I can't help you uh, because you're not being honest with me. And I sure. think that's why I'm able to build relationships fast with people. Uh, I can relate to people because I've had bad credit in the past and we fixed that and you move forward and you level up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of like your concept. I remember the first time you bought a car, you were like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I've mm-hmm. always bought everything cash. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> you right. Know? That's right. And I just hit it to boost my credit. That's right. right. So, yeah. And, and I don't know if you remember, I went in and I was like, you know, they were doing, I went to the finance yep. person and they were like, oh, we can get you a great rate. You know, we can get you two, you know, 3.99. Yep. And I'm like, I have over a 700 credit score. I'm putting <laughs> a lot of money down. I said, either you're going to get me a 1.99 or I'm going to walk out of here. And you're not going to make any money off of me. That's right. She got me that 1.99 real fast. That's right. So again, when you have good credit and you know how to leverage what you have, mm-hmm. then you can get lower rates and save you a lot of money. Absolutely. And I remember the interest that I paid on that car in my five years of owning it before I paid it off, literally inflation was more than that. I it was insane. It. Right? I so like it, yeah. I actually like made money, right? Cause I <laughs> put it right. into a property. That's so right. it's just crazy. Like, so if you know how to utilize that stuff and yeah, obviously you got an expert over here, Mark, that can teach you that, then you can really come out ahead. So another thing I want to ask, if we were to explain to people mm-hmm. and even realtors, how a loan works um, from kind of start to finish, but not in extreme detail, the way I explain it to people is it's like a hamburger. Okay. Okay. The loan officer is like the top bun. The processor is the meat, mm-hmm. right? And the underwriter is the bottom bun. That's the way I kind of explain it. The, and I know you like to use analogies. I, um, I like to use that. So how would you explain it? And the reason why I say that, because the loan officer is like the face. It's the yeah. first thing you see, right? The but pro- the loan officer should be more th- than the face, but you are correct. Yes. I mean, your, your, your loan officer is going to be your point of contact for everything until they themselves either introduce you to the next person in, in the chain. <laughs> um, but they should always be involved is what you're saying. Oh, absolutely. But every bite of that burger you take, you're taking a bite of the top bun. That's right. So, you know what I'm saying? I hate to say that. <laughs> it's that's true. That's so awesome. You know it what is. I'm saying? Yes. It is true. So, but the processor, right, is like the meat because they do a, a good majority of the work of putting everything together to make it look good for the underwriter, right? right. Who is your last line of defense, that bottom bun that says, hey, your loan is approved put it, or put not. Put it this way. The underwriter is the only one that can approve a loan. A loan officer can deny a loan, not sure, approve a loan. But not approve. Okay, Correct. that's a good way to put yeah. it. And then when it comes to what uh, you want to look for from a loan officer to buyer's perspective is just remember the acronym CIA, Credit Income Assets. That's what we're looking for. So yep. so that's what you would say. This is what you need to qualify for a loan. Correct. Credit income and, and assets. assets. Yep. Okay. That's, and that's, exactly that's good. So anything else I, I missed on elaborating on that, that people, I mean, that's know? a whole nother conversation. I know it is. That's a whole not going into extreme detail, but if you were to give it, we in can a do nutshell, this every two weeks. <laughs> if you're to give it in a nutshell, right. That's because a lot of people don't yeah. know how it works, especially first time home buyers. I would say yeah. it is a process. You're mm-hmm. never going to, as a buyer, you're never going to speak to an underwriter. Uh, it's just not something that's going to happen. We also have a closer that's involved that helps us communicate with the title company to make sure all of the fees and and charges that we disclose to you up front are as accurate as possible in the end. Um, but in regards to your processor, that's the next person in the team that is going to be communicating with your borrowers directly, collecting conditions. Um, I really don't like my processors explaining too, too much of the details of the loan itself, the lock itself, anything like that, because essentially that's my job. That's your job. Uh, yep. If a loan officer yep. can't explain those things, then you are just a paper pusher. You are just a shiny object, in my opinion. Okay. Let's, and you helped me. You did my loan on my first one. Yeah. Okay. So I want to tell a, a quick story and then I want you to elaborate on this because I think this will really help a lot of people. Well, we got, we got, we'll be, we'll be fast. We got seven minutes. That's good. Okay. So it'll be, it'll be pretty quick. Okay. But, Remember, I went to go buy my first home and 
my my dad, he was he was very at least smart in making me get credit cards when I was really yeah, young absolutely. to build credit, right? Because you don't build credit unless you have debt, right? Mm-hmm. Which it's uh, credit is really stupid how it works. Fickle. It's the yep. the ability not to completely pay off debt, but to have low balances of debt and to pay it yeah. reoccurring, right? Correct. So and and mm-hmm. to to help people that are lending you money want to know that you have a history of paying somebody back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and balance is low, right? Especially when it comes to credit cards. It doesn't right? matter. At the end so, of the day, are you paying on money time? Back. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I had these credit cards when I was young. At 16 years old, I got two credit cards. So when I went to go buy my first home at 23 or mm-hmm. whatever I was, I would charge a bunch of money on them every month. And maybe they had $2,000 right. rates or something. And I would pay them off in full every month, mm-hmm. right? Every single month. Yeah. And when I went to go buy my first home, I was thinking- my credit is going to be the Immaculate. bomb. It's yeah. going to be the bomb because I've never missed the payment ever. It's going to be amazing. And then you pull my score and you're like, you're at a 640. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, how am I at a 640? I've never that. missed a payment ever that. in my life. Yeah. Why was I at a 640? So essentially, gentlemen and ladies, if you are playing the, let's call it credit card game, where you use your credit card to get points like we do and you pay it off every month and you just basically stick it to the credit card companies the best way you know how. You need to plan to leave a small balance for a month so that it can re- register that within the system, and then you can continue down your road. But if you are uh, not monitoring your credit and the day that the uh, creditor reports to each of the bureaus, you may catch it on a time that your balance is full uh, or a time that your balance is at zero. Either one of those, zero or too much on it, is going to give you an adverse effect on your credit. Um, so definitely 30% is that, that happy go. medium that's, rule. That's what, so explain, wait, explain it. Yeah, explain keeping that. a 30% balance or less. And I go even further than that. If you can do 10% or less, there's additional points within that. But I will tell you, every credit score is like a thumbprint. They're all different. Every single one of them, what you do for one may not happen to the other. Matter of fact, I'll go even further. You've got three credit bureaus. If you do something to Equifax, it may not even affect your other two bureaus. So make sure if you're working with a lender that they run the scenarios and know what to tell you to do on each of the bureaus, not just this general information. Uh, And that's that's what I'll leave it. That's that's exactly right. And and so when people say, hey, my credit karma says this, why is that okay but not great? Number one, credit karma uses a completely different scoring model. Number two. When's the last time you got a loan from uh, Credit Karma? Hmm? Not going to happen. Reason being is they have to give you something of value to justify what they're charging you. The monitoring of your credit is fine, but then when they add that score that they're using their own scoring model for, it makes you as the consumer feel like you're getting something for your money. Um, Every lender uses a different scoring model, whether it be mortgage lenders um, auto lenders, credit card lenders, et cetera. There are different scoring models out there. And I think it's important for you guys to just monitor your credit, stay ahead of the game. Um, the best thing I can tell you, pay your bills on time. That is the number one. I don't care if you've got high balances, pay the bill on time. And that's the advice I'd give on that. Okay. Very yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, another podcast on credit, I think would help a lot. Of okay. I'm getting, and we yeah. can bring uh, uh, Dylan yeah. Shibley on here. Uh, that would be, ex- I mean, an expert. He's you know, an that, expert. Yeah, yeah. That knows the stuff. I'm all for that. Two you to know, three help, weeks. Let's do it. Help a ton of people. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for tuning into this episode of uh, me and Austin ranting about uh, anything and everything. But uh, Austin, thank you for joining. You got anything else you want to add? No, just I really appreciate being here. It's been a long time. <laughs> You're the man. Yeah, it has so been too long. Thank you. Uh, Guys, make sure to like, subscribe, share with a friend. Um, But we will catch you on the next one. Welcome to Key Factors Podcast, where knowledge meets ambition in the fast paced world of real estate and mortgage. I'm your host, Mark Jones, bringing you the latest insight, trends, and expert advice to navigate this dynamic property market. In each episode, we dive deep into the heart of the industry, dissecting market movement exploring investment strategies, and unlocking the secret to real estate success. Whether you're a seasoned professional, an aspiring investor, or simply looking to stay ahead of the curve, this is the ultimate guide to making informed decisions in the world of property and real estate. So grab a seat and let's uncover the key factors that make all the difference. Welcome to Key Factors Podcast. Let the journey begin.